what I'm going to do is introduce Dr. John McNaught. He is the medical director at Fertility Ontario, and that's in London, Ontario. He's extremely passionate about his career and loves helping people build their families. He does a lot of outreach through social media and the website and has greatly enjoyed um, this successful webinar series over the past year and a half. And we are also joined by Dr. Scott Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton earned his degrees at Western University and trained in the IVF program in London, Ontario. After directing the IVF laboratory at the Heartland Fertility and Gynecology Clinic in Manitoba, he returned back to Ontario to direct the embryology laboratory at ISIS Regional Fertility in, Man in Mississauga. So welcome Dr. John McNaught and Dr. Scott Hamilton. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, I guess we'll get right into it then. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for coming and taking time out of your busy schedule to with us. This is um, one of many webinars that we've done with a creative so we're getting the hang of it by now. Melissa is always here to help us out and make sure that things go smoothly and feel free to ask any questions and she'll do her best to make sure that they get answered by either myself or Dr. Hamilton. Now although you can hear us and interact with us this is a confidential environment so no one else knows that you're on the call um, feel free to ask any questions anonymously and we are not going to identify you as the call person. In line with that, just know that although we're going to be answering um, questions in a very general way, the comments or, or advice from myself or Dr. Hamilton don't constitute specific medical advice. We don't know your case well enough to give you specific medical advice. Okay, so this is sort of a timely topic. Um, there's been a lot in the local media and the national media about government regulation and government funding for various types of fertility therapy. And the backstory behind that is looking for cost savings to government and to taxpayers through reducing the burden of multiple pregnancies. So we want to look at that a little bit from an evidence based standpoint and understand what that could mean for Ontarians. We're going to look at the impact of various types of fertility therapies and how they contribute to the burden of multiple pregnancies, as well as review 2009 recommendation for the government ex expert panel looking at the impact. Mm -hmm. We're at ISIS Fertility Center. Dr. Hamilton has. <laughs> really taken ISIS to the forefront of fertility therapy in Canada, worked very diligently to create a culture of excellence in Mississauga, um, done outstanding work with technologies and techniques that enable fantastic results in electus cell embryo transfer. Now talk to us tonight about those scientific advancements and at the end of the call have an open forum for any questions. So, very briefly, talking about multiple pregnancy, realize that it's a natural event. Human beings do have twin offspring in approximately 50% of natural conceptions. And in very rare instances, we'll give birth to more than twins triplets are higher, what are called high order multiple births. But those are exceedingly rare in natural circumstances. So if we look at the province of Ontario, pretty consistently year after year, there's about 140,000 births in the province. And if we looked at natural twinning rate, with the effect of our 2% natural conception, of our 140,000, we have about 2,800 natural multiple births created. In reality, the real number is about 5,400, and that tells us that something is amiss. It's obviously some external factor that is creating more multiple births in our province and in our country than our 
natural twinning rate would increase. And as we'll know, that's something in fertility therapy. Canada, North America, and in particularly Ontario, there are tens of thousands of patients every year without modern fertility therapy. Because IVF has been a science that has been in development over the past 30 years, it is constantly evolving. We always strive to achieve better pregnancy rates. And as our pregnancy rates go up, the typical pattern is that we see the rates of multiple births go up along with them. As we become more effective at creating pregnancy, the possibility of creating more than one pregnancy at a time will often increase. And seen in the media, IVF or in vitro fertilization is often implicated as one of the greatest sources of multiple birth in modern North America. This slide is just reminding us that we get multiple births from lots of other sources as well. As we pointed out, there is a 2% natural twinning um, rate in all human conception. If you use a commonly prescribed oral medication called clomiphene citrate, which is still the most commonly used fertility medication in the world, rates of twinning are 8 to 12 percent, significantly above natural. If you look to the next sort of most common form of assisted reproductive technique, get an insemination with injectable gonadotropins or follicle stimulating hormones. find that the twinning rate rises to about 20 to 25 percent. Kelly, are we still there? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. I'm okay, good. Um, IUI is performed about 22,000 times every year in Ontario. Um, at a twinning rate of 20 to 25 percent, it's actually the largest source of multiple births in the province. Just behind that is IVF, which has a higher pregnancy rate and a slightly higher multiple birth rate. But because it's performed such fewer times than IUI or, or even clomiphene citrate, it actually doesn't contribute as high a burden of multiple birth as lesser technologies. And the important thing to understand, Dr. Hamilton is going to touch on this later, is that IVF is the only technology other than natural fertility therapy that allows us to control the rates of multiple pregnancy. Now, the reason that this is so important is that multiple pregnancies are high risk pregnancies. They increase risk to the baby, they increase risk to the mother. And ultimately, that increases cost, taxpayers, and the system. So we see that in a twin gestation, more than 50% of twins and more than 90% of triplets are born at low birth weights, less than 2,500 grams. They're also born early, less than 37 weeks. And both of these factors yield to substantial use of resources special care nurseries and NICUs around the province. Premature babies are often born with immature lungs, which increases the time that they spend in special care nurseries and also leads to chronic respiratory problems that can affect these children for several years into their life. Very costly. as the children grow up, is something that's hard to quantify. After the babies leave the hospital and develop into children, we find that babies who are born at low birth weights are more likely to die during the first year of their life and have a higher risk of developing learning disabilities, developmental disabilities, and visual and respiratory problems. So the story doesn't stop once the child leaves the hospital. 
and realistically the, the burden of multiple pregnancies becomes even harder to quantify as the children grow up. We certainly know that both the children and their parents are faced with numerous challenges as these children grow older. When we're trying to quantify the costs associated with multiple births, this is one of the hardest things to do now. The babies and the children inside, we also have to remember the mothers. Women who are pregnant with multiple children are much more likely to have complications, often three to seven times more likely to have anemia associated with pregnancy, hypertension, gestational diabetes, um, risk of cesarean section. In a former life, when I used to deliver babies, the simplest way I could explain it to people was think of any complication associated with pregnancy, and it significantly increases the risk. In the setting of a triplet pregnancy, those risks go even higher. So there's a greater risk of premature labor, a much greater risk of surgical delivery by cesarean section, and then after the babies are born, Postpartum complications like bleeding, infection, and postpartum depression are far more common in the mothers of, of twin and triplet births. So just as with the babies who leave hospital, the story doesn't end after the moms leave the hospital. And the burden on them is significant as they try to raise more than one child at once. So in 2009, the government recognized this as a serious problem, and it commissioned an expert panel to look at ways of reducing multiple pregnancy, particularly those that were associated with fertility therapy. The expert panel tackled two major issues. One was access to fertility care, and the other was access to adoption services. And as most people know, back in 2009, the official recommendation was that the government should fund cycles of in vitro fertilization in the hope that the doing cost savings would actually cause less burden to our already cash-strapped healthcare system. And I'll go over some of their findings in brief, but this document is available online for anyone who wants to look at it. So the expert panel recognize that there's a growing number of Ontarians who seek fertility treatment on an annual basis. And we can see that even back in 2004, there were already more than 75,000 people in Ontario who were actively seeking fertility therapy. In 2014, that number is even higher. And we know that patients aren't just seeking therapy through physicians, they're also going to allied healthcare professionals and various online sites looking for any help that they can, something that is really a growing problem for people. As far as being a world leader, you really think that Ontario has fallen behind. You look at some European districts that have regulated and funded their fertility services, and they have a much lower rate of associated multiple birth than we see in Ontario. And actually, we're as high as our neighbors in in the United States, where the system is, is really unregulated and sometimes quite aggressive. So Ontario has a long way to go if we're going to start reaching sort of levels that our European partners and also our neighbors in Quebec have illustrated over the past several years. Some of those classic examples that are noted very often are in Belgium, Belgium and Finland, and that over the past 10 to 15 years, these regions have dropped their multiple rate associated with IVF and fertility therapy significantly. Um, numbers that were as high as 30% are now 5 to 50%. Um, in Finland, the proportion of single embryo transfers is significantly while the multiple birth rate is now below 7%. So the key feature among Belgium, Australia, Finland, and Sweden is that all of these jurisdictions have some form of funding for fertility therapy. 
And with funding comes regulation. There's better patient education, better cohesion amongst physicians, and we find that when the financial burden is taken away from patients, they typically will make better decisions with regard to their fertility care. How that might look in Ontario if the recommendations of the expert panel were adopted is we can look at how things currently look 10 years from the report if we don't halt the progression of multiple birth associated with fertility therapy and how things could look in a funded system. And you notice that even with funding, there is still going to be some multiple birth associated with fertility therapy, but it's far less than what we need in unfunded and unregulated systems. And when you're talking about a reduction in hundreds of multiple births per year, that's a significant cost saving to the government and to the taxpayer. Because multiple births cause, even in the acute phase, a tremendous amount of spending at the public health care level. In the expert panel, they estimated that for every child born less than 2,500 grams, there would be about a million dollars spent over the lifetime of that child in public money. And when we know that 50% of twins are going to fall into that birth weight range, even reducing 300 multiple births per year represents potential massive savings. And that was what they projected in terms of their very realistic, very pragmatic calculations, is that over the course of 10 years, the cost savings associated with funding and allowing access to IVF would save the province approximately $440 million. And Similar calculations have been done in Alberta. We're seeing it now in Quebec, where their rates of multiple birth have, have plummeted substantially since adopting a regulated system. And we're hoping to see the cost savings analysis come out of their special care nurseries at NIC. So that was a very whirlwind tour through multiple birth. I think hopefully you can understand why lessening multiple pregnancies can be beneficial both to fertility patients and to taxpayers. And to tell us how we're going to do it, I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Hamilton. Thank you very much, Dr. McNaught. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my experience with trying to move towards a single embryo transfer. I think you've given an excellent introduction into the rationale as to why you should go that way. I think if I move the slide, you're going to control that for me, right? Yep. So I work out of the ISIS Regional Facility Center. And I'm going to give you the embryologist view of the single embryo trans. I mean, I, I oversee um, the generation of those embryos from eggs, and I know a little bit about the quality, and I can look at some of the stimulation and the characteristics of patients that lead to the embryos, the numbers, and the qualities that we have. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the past trends in embryo transfer in Canada, a little bit about single embryo transfer cost versus benefit, some of the factors in the decision whether or not uh, single embryo transfer is right for you, and the importance of improving embryo freezing and thawing technology. So you have to have a good freezing program to be able to be successful with the single embryo transfer. You want to have good ability to use embryos that you don't transfer. So Canada has actually Canada's been very good, good at moving towards reducing multiples. And we've done this largely without the, the pressure of the government in terms of So it's been a voluntary. There is an IVF improvement group, and there's virtually all clinics 
have submitted data to a central registry. We combine our data of all kinds of aspects of an IVF cycle, leading out to pregnancy, multiple pregnancy, and complications that result from that. And we've done this every year at our annual meeting from 1999. And I've just taken a, a kind of a couple of years' data. The trend has been the same, spread it out. But in 2005 and 2012, take a look at the number of embryos transferred. The range was 2.1 to 2.7. And the 2.1 would be for younger age groups. We have a, a couple of different age groupings that we do. And the 2.7 would be for patients with over. In 2012, the same age grouping was reduced at a range of 1.4 to 2. Now, part of that was influenced by the funding state of, uh, of Quebec, where um, clinics would not receive funding for their program if they had an unacceptably high multiple pregnancy. And so there is a significant number of cycles that arose in Quebec during that period of time, and that did drive the average down. But the country as a whole also has reduced. And then just for comparison, I put our clinic data for 2013. And if we combine all of our age groups, our average number of embryos transferred is 1.3. We rarely, uh, I think probably two times out of 700 transfers, there's more than two. And if you take a look at the next row down, the impact on pregnancy rate, it, um, this just happened as the improving technology over the years. Um, in general, success rate of IVF improves at about 1% per year. That's what our data has shown. And so if you take a look at the difference between 2005 and 2012 for the country, it's been uh, increased from 30.1% to 36.6%. So it's, it's about that 1%. Um, and then a year later, in our per transfer, 41 41 Multiples, as Dr. McNaught pointed out, the Canadian data very much reflects his earlier slides that he put up there. 2005, when people transferred embryos to try and get the best pregnancy rate they could, the multiple pregnancy rate, according to our Carter data, was 30.7% multiple. So of 30% of people who got pregnant, more than 30% of those actually had more than one variant. Um, partially because of the impact of Quebec and partially because we are trying to improve the quality of care in Canada. 2012, it dropped to 17%, so almost cut in half. And then just for comparison, at ISIS, it happens to be 11.1%. Because we do a lot of single embryo transfers, and the only way you get twins from doing single embryo transfer is identical twins when the embryo is split. Um, and in order to be able to promote single embryo transfer, you have to have decent um, ability to freeze and thaw your embryos. And again, showing the data that just happened over the country, the pregnancy rate for thawed embryos in 2005 was 20%. And I didn't put the, the average number of embryos that were transferred, but there's certainly significantly more frozen embryos transferred per transfer than fresh embryos because people over the years have believed that they don't have the same. 2012, there was an overall increase in, in the best rate of embryo freezing and thawing, and so that pregnancy rate was 31%. And at ISIS, where I can pull our data, it's 32%, which is it depends on which period of time you pick. That's actually low um, compared to what it was. At, year earlier, but it's still a respectable pregnancy rate. And 1.2 embryos, by far the majority, over 80% of transfer, one thought embryo. Um, if you look at the percentage of single embryo transfers, that, that's a, an elective single embryo transfer when a couple has more than one embryo and they choose to only transfer one. In 2005, 
it was very rare in elective surgical embryo transfer. And it was less than 10% of the embryo transfers were an elective single embryo transfer. With the impact of Quebec and quality improvement, 22% uh, it had risen in 2012. And in our program, 35%, and it's increasing all the time, 35% of our embryo transfers are an elective. And as I said, 80% of them are. Next slide, please. So if we look a little bit about just an embryologist can use the benefit and cost. The benefit of doing a single embryo transfer increases the likelihood of health for all the reasons that Dr. McCott out. Um, human female is meant to safely carry one baby. Obstetrician and health care in Ontario is pretty good. And so it's not often that there's bad outcomes from from twin pregnancies. But with all the twin pregnancies that happen, there are a significant number of not great outcomes. And even in our experience, we've seen um, two or three cases of twin pregnancies that we really wish you'd never participate. So while IVF twin pregnancies may be 50% cheaper, and often patients are the ones that drive um, transferring more embryos because they're paying a lot of money for this, I'd really like to get the second one so while IVF twin pregnancies may be 50% cheaper than two separate singleton IVF pregnancies, the complicated pregnancies, they don't go well all the time. And there's also, people don't think of the challenges of raising two kids the same age at the same time. And uh, I've certainly spoken to counselors, and that's something that you can find out afterwards. There's a lot of support groups that have twins and triplets not resulting from the uh, Pregnancy complications is challenges of kids at the same time. And then a benefit would be if there was pressure from a provincial health plan, if you're forced to have only a single number of transfers, of course, that's, uh, that's a benefit that you can't deny. And that's the way that it works largely. Because the clinic have to keep their multiple pregnancy rate, I think it's under 7%. Um, basically, there's a huge drive to do a single embryo transfer, or they could lose their funding. So if you look at the cost, the added cost of not doing two embryos is you have to have, and if you don't get pregnant from the first one, then you have to have a thaw cycle. And there is, thaw cycles aren't cheap, but they're significantly cheaper than stress cycles way less medication, it's less expensive medication. Um, the laboratory work and the procedural work, there's no egg retrieval, all those things are less expensive. So there is the expense of having that thaw transfer, but it's, it's far less significant than undergoing another full idea. So if you want to have a successful single embryo transfer, what are you going to need? You're going to have good patient selection and stimulation protocols, and I'll leave that to this discussion. But it is important to bring somebody that's going to give good quality eggs and embryos so that each embryo that you're transferring one at a time has good potential to establish a successful pregnancy. You need a good laboratory environment for promoting healthy embryo development. So if you've, if you've got those good eggs and the good stimulation to start with, and then you've got good sperm to, to join it with, you need to keep it in an environment for up to a week where you're not going to compromise the potential of the egg, sperm, and every other. I'm surprised you didn't put that one first. Well, you're hosting. <laughs> uh, you need a good embryo transfer technique. It's uh, there is certainly a skill and practice is required. Again, that's a physician component to it. And there's definitely a knack for it. Physicians, if you look at um, transfer rates for varying physicians in any program, some are better than others. Um, the goal in a program is to have the good ones 
teach their skills to the ones that, that are less good, and then everybody hopefully can achieve the same uh, technique and the same success rate. And again, the big thing is if you got extra embryos, you need that good embryo free. So I just put a few slides that we can put through. So at an egg retrieval, these are what eggs look like when they come out of the ovary and they're rinsed off. Those are good looking eggs. And you're gonna we're gonna be responsible in the lab for getting those eggs through the first pretty much a week of pregnancy. Uh, we don't always do ICSI, but that shows an egg from inside those um, cumulus cells that surround it like a cloud, and we picked up a sperm at the bottom right side there. A uh, nice mature egg, and so if you do ICSI, you have to focus sperm into that. Whether you're doing regular IVF or you're doing ICSI, cytoplasmic sperm injection, they have to go into um, a nice incubator environment with the right temperature, the right pH. And so there, there's a stack of incubators, big box incubators, there are small incubators, but the environment is the same. And they're going to spend the majority of the week in those incubators. We take them out very for a few minutes each day to assess how things are. So after the first day, that was enough. The egg and the sperm should have got together, and so we've got a nice fertilized egg there. There's two little clear circles in the center of that, that egg. Those are pronuclei, which are half nucleuses, uh, egg one from the sperm. And there's two polar bodies out at nine o'clock there. Those are the started extra chromosomes from the egg as it comes. And then we put them back in the incubator and we check them the next day. They should have divided at least once and they get to the two or four cell stage. And then we put them back in the incubator again and we take them out and hopefully they look like this on the third day. This is an eight cell embryo with very little fragmentation. Um, not that long ago, our goal would be to transfer. That, that's the goal, transfer two embryos. Our first step was not to get to a single embryo transfer. It was to get people reduced to having two embryos transferred instead of three. Um, and not that long ago when we transferred two embryos, our multiple pregnancy rate was 30%. And so people that got pregnant, there was a high proportion that both of those ended. Now between this stage and the stage I'm gonna show you next, there are new genes that become essential to differentiating that embryo to the next stage. And for the first time, the sperm becomes important driving the embryo development. And so it, it's been known for some time that approximately half the embryos don't have the machinery or the genetic potential to make the transition from one stage to the next stage. So if you show them a slide. So this is a blastocyst. And, and an embryo will reach the blastocyst sometime day five or day six usually. Um, and this is a differentiation. Now there's two cell types. The, um, the ring around the, I, I think of it kind of as an inverted diamond ring. The band around the outside is the prophectoderm layer, and that forms the placenta. It invades into the wall of the uterus and establishes a blood supply. The gem kind of pointing into the center of it is the inner cell mass, and that's stem cells. This, and you hear about stem cell research a lot of times. Stem cells become every other cell type of and so this is a blastocyst of two types of cells. And it's a very nice one. Of course, I'm going to put a nice one on for um, presentation. So if we can transfer one of these embryos, there's an excellent chance of pregnancy. And I'll show you from my data, it's probably over 50% for, for most of those embryos that you transfer. And it's going to go up or down a little bit depending on maternal age, because maternal age determines through um, developmental potential. And if we have one more of these, or two more, or three more, they freeze very nicely. And when we thaw them out, if you thaw them out well, they will pick up exactly where they left. Dr. Hamilton, move on with questions here. Okay. Am I supposed to see that somewhere? 
nope, it's okay. I'm just going to read it. <laughs> and hopefully my audio is a little bit better. We're dealing with some echo issues. So thank you everybody for kind of dealing with that. It's, it's quite unusual, but so, so this question is from Rebecca. Okay. And she says, can you clarify the importance of sperm for the growth of the embryo from day three to day five? Sure. Uh, okay, so, oh, that's me. Okay. So there's the embryo up until day three. It's the, um, the nucleic acid from the egg itself drives all the division and uh, the early potential of that embryo to keep dividing and dividing. The, the, the sperm, its um, genes and chromosomes are carried along along with the egg as a free ride for those first two years. So between day three and day five, genes within the sperm and actually some new genes within the egg, they become essential to making that embryo become blossom. Um, it, now, it's actually very hard to, to determine which, um, whether it's a sperm or whether it's the egg, that plays the biggest role in the embryo not being able to make differentiation for the next stage. But there are some characteristics of sperm that have been linked to this. And one of the fairly recent, but not so recent anymore, is they can do what's called DNA fragmentation. And DNA fragmentation is a measure of the intactness of the, the DNA within the sperm. And somebody that, a male, that has a high level of DNA fragmentation tends to have um, sperm that are less able to get embryos to that next stage. And if they do make it to that next stage, potentially to implantation or continuing pregnancy. There, there may be similar impacts on the egg, but the, the one that they've been able to measure most is the DNA fragmentation. Now, in term, and the thing about DNA fragmentation is it doesn't really change significantly the appearance or the behavior of the sperm. So often males that have very good-looking sperm, good counts, and good motility still can have that DNA fragmentation that is linked to reduced embryo development. People that have severe male factor, so they might have a very low sperm count, they might have sluggish motility or low motility, um, that's more of a performance issue for the sperm and the ability of the sperm to get to the egg and get into it, but it, but it doesn't have to be directly linked to the genetics of the sperm. I don't know if that answers the question. It's a long one, but um, any clarification, let me know. Um. Uh, that was that. Um, before we jump on to the next, so we can talk about the hand. Um, and the question is: Is it therefore more beneficial to transfer on day five? And Rebecca says, "Thank you." Okay. It, it is more beneficial to transfer. I believe it is more beneficial to transfer on day five. I I do have a little bit of data coming up on that, but basically that's the point. Um, I, I probably should have made it clear earlier on. If you're going to reduce the number of embryos that you get to transfer, then you want to increase the likelihood as much as possible that the one you pick has the ability to keep going. And so our, our data and our experience showed early on that is, if you give us a chance in our laboratory to choose two day three embryos that we like, we're going to have a very good chance that one of those has the ability to keep going. Unfortunately, a lot of times, both of them have the ability to keep going, and therefore you get the high incidence. Of so absolutely, single embryo trans transfer, the majority of people that do it successfully, uh, do it by culturing the embryos out to day five and transferring only one to day five. Because you've eliminated up to half the embryos that weren't going to make it anyway. And so they aren't there, you don't have them to choose. Okay? All right, thank you. So the recommended criteria for 
transfer, um, doing a single embryo transfer, what's going to help you make that decision? Younger, unfortunately, younger is better in, in terms of eggs. Um, a woman is born with her lifetime supply of eggs. In fact, before she's born, she has her lifetime supply of eggs. And she never makes another one after birth. And everything that a woman goes through in her life, you know, illnesses, environments, and all that, her eggs go through with her. And so just like all the rest of us, our body parts, as, as you age, they, they take a few. So um, female age under 38 at the age um, at egg retrieval, it's certainly worth considering single embryo transfer. In addition to that, or maybe if somebody's older, you can use this as another rationale instead. Um, reasonable ovarian reserve and response to medication. As as a laboratory person. I actually see that happen. So I, I already have the ability to tell Dr. McNaught when he's discussing a patient, well, this is how many eggs I got, and you, this is how many we're going to get based on your last ultrasound. But if somebody's thinking ahead of time when they're starting their cycle, you know, I, I, I'm concerned about multiple pregnancies, how do, I, how do I know if single embryo transfer is right for me? There are some predictors. And a while back, um, at day three, blood measurement of your follicle stimulating hormone was a reasonable indicator of your ovarian reserve. And the analogy that I kind of use for that is the ovary is like, um, is, is like an ear and the brain is like a voice. And every month a woman's voice from the brain says, make me some eggs. And if the ovary is very good of hearing, it hears it, and it makes lots of follicles that will give rise to a mature egg. And as we age, um, the ovary also ages, and it gets a little bit deaf. And so the brain has to yell louder to get some eggs made. And that yelling louder is seen as the follicle stimulating hormone. So it does give a little bit of a warning that ovarian reserve is going down. More recently, anti mullerian hormone is is a, a factor that's produced from the ovary, from the, the cells that surround the egg. And, and the higher that signal is, the more likely there is that there's a good supply of eggs. And so those two blood tests can give your doctor an idea of what your reserve is. And if you have good reserve, single embryo transfer Once we're in the lab, and you don't, have to, you don't have to make your decision permanently right from the beginning. You do have the ability to change your mind. And so based on how many eggs you have, and then how many of them fertilize the second day, and then how well they divide on the third day, now you've got some good ability to say, I, I feel good about doing this on day five. If something worries the physician or worries the patient, you do have the option to say, you know, maybe we'd rather do on day three. So, but in terms of just what I'm seeing in the laboratory, if you have four good quality embryos on day three, so they're, they're seven to nine cells, and they don't have very much fragmentation, you're in good shape to get at least one glossus and potentially one more to freeze. And as somebody asked earlier on, you want to transfer the blossom stage, if at all possible, because then you've selected for the ones that definitely are going to make it, instead of the ones that look like they should make it. So freezing. When patients have more than one good embryo to transfer, and they only transfer one, you get to use the ones later if they're of good quality. It's going to rely on good freezing and thawing, as I said. And fall cycles are nice because they involve a lot less invasiveness in medication. So they may actually contribute to a more favorable uterine environment. And because of the trends that we see in the ability to freeze and thaw embryos, there's actually a fair number of programs in 
world. Um, they're not the majority yet, but there's a fair number of programs that actually opt to freeze all embryos and don't do a fresh embryo transfer at all. They choose to, to freeze them and thaw them back one at a time. There have been some improvements in freezing. I didn't put a lot of data slides up, but I can tell you freezing, embryo freezing has been around almost as long as in vitro fertilization for patients. So um, it's certainly 30 years that they've been freezing embryos. And I would say probably 15 years ago, the success rate of embryo freezing was under 10%. We saw the embryo out and did embryo transfer. Um, and that, that, that even goes back to where the Carter data, the Canadian registry data, it was under 10% for a number of years overall. Um, it has now increased, and I showed you the data from 2012. It's, it's approaching the fresh embryo transfer rate, particularly if you correct it for doing a single. That particular data gets biased a little bit because in order for somebody to have a frozen embryo, it can be thought and transferred back. They tend to be better prognosis patients. So it's not quite as good as fresh embryo transfer overall, but it's, it's very quickly approaching. Um, there were two types of embryo freezing. 30 years ago, it was what was called the slow freeze approach. Um, and in order to freeze an, an embryo or any cell, you need to remove the majority of the water from the cell. Because if you were to freeze a cell without removing the water, it forms ice crystals. And it's, it's a bit like having an icicle form in your liver or your kidney. Um, it, it will kill the cell. So the, the approaches are to replace the water with something that behaves in the cell like water, but will not form ice crystals. And these are actually very similar to the chemicals that you have in your wiper fluid to stop the, uh, the wiper fluid from freezing when you squirt it on your windshield. So it's toxic, but it behaves very much like water, and the exposure is very brief. So in the slow freeze technology, People knew that these chemicals were toxic, and so they wanted to come up with ways to expose the cell or the embryo to as little of that toxic chemical as they could. And so they, they devised programmable freezers that would freeze the, the, or lower the temperature of the embryo and freeze it very slowly and carefully. And by doing that, they could use a lower concentration. But at the same time, it would, it's a two-hour process. And so it would expose that cell for a two-hour period. Um, and during that, during that time over the last 30 years, um, a number of scientists were promoting a higher concentration of the nasty chemical, but really short exposure. And that's how vitrification developed. So our embryo freezing solutions that we use now are actually very similar to what we used 30 years ago. And up to five years ago, but they're far lower, or sorry, they're far higher concentration. And instead of doing a two-hour program, we plunge them into liquid nitrogen, and they immediately freeze, and they won't be exposed to that chemical because the cell's metabolism stops. So the short answer to that is vitrification is a fast freeze. And what's happened to that um, is the embryo before and after freezing looks nearly identical. It looks like you never did anything to that embryo, textbook. I was a bit of a skeptic when we first started using this approach because, again, these chemicals are very similar to what we used to use to fix cells for electron microscopy. And I thought they were preserving these embryos dead and just making them look good, but they're dead. Um, but the, the results have spoken for themselves. And so after seeing trends in Europe, um, we've adopted that in Canada, and we've adopted it very successfully. You can apply this freezing technology to all stages of embryo development. And in fact, it, it's, it's good enough that you can actually freeze eggs using it. And that's been one of the big improvements of vitro. 
an egg is a very fragile cell because it's, it's part way through a division. It has a spindle and it maintains that spindle holding the chromosomes in place. And low freeze technology that we used to use had a very poor survival rate when we applied it to eggs. So you can freeze eggs using nitrification quite successfully. Um, and it's been very good for creating donor egg banks outside of Canada. You can freeze fertilized eggs, you can freeze dividing eggs, you can freeze morelas, and you can freeze blossoms. And they all survive very well, and it's a similar approach. The earlier you freeze your embryo, the more you have. You feel good about that. But the less you know about the developmental potential of that embryo, and so you won't find out until after you thaw them out. And so because of that, our approach is to the majority of the time, let the embryos go out to the blossom stage, let them prove their potential first, and when you're scheduling a thaw transfer in the future, whether it's for another child or for another try in that particular cycle, you know that you're thawing out something that has... Blossoms have already achieved that good development of potential, and they're ready to implant. When we thaw them out and transfer them, they are probably ready to attach to the uterus during that day. And this just shows uh, some of the equipment. That we use. It's actually very simple compared to the programmable freezers we used to use. Um, the, it, it's not a high magnification, so the microscope in the top left corner there is it's a simple dissection microscope. We work under probably 10 to 15 times magnification. The top right is, it's almost like a little plastic spoonula. You deposit the embryo on that after it's been exposed to chemical preservatives, and then you dip it into liquid nitrogen and it immediately freezes. Um, the bottom left are just the cassettes and Kings and goblets that you store them in. They're labeled with a number, patient name, the date that you did it. And the bottom right is a doer, which is essentially a big coffee thermos. And the, the wire coming out the front right is uh, an alarm system. So if anything were to lower the level of nitrogen in it, that would put uh, the possibility of embryos flying, and it would trigger our alarm, and we can close it right away. They're very reliable. They don't require energy. It's just a thermal. So, to, I mean, just a little bit of results to try and give you an impression of, of how we're getting this way. So if we take a look at this, what I'm comparing is the new approach to the, the recent but older approach. So are we going to transfer one embryo on day five, or are we going to transfer two embryos on day five? So if you take a look at the, the left panel, the red and the blue bars. On day three, these are transferring two embryos like we would have done in the past. Um, and the blue is all ages, the red is a younger age group. You got about a 40% pregnancy rate, that's uh, fetal heart, per transfer. And if you take kind of the same group of people and you leave them to day five and you opt to transfer only one of those, the pregnancy rate is actually a little bit higher. And particularly younger patients, higher still, that the potential of the embryo, everything goes better. So you, you are not wasting, you're not taking any significant chance by doing a day five versus transfer, and, and one is a good one. And this shows if the embryo that you've chosen not to transfer and you're going to freeze it, if you thaw that embryo out afterwards, um, and the number, of, okay, so the bar on the left, these are single thawed embryo transfers. A uh, hundred times, we transferred only one embryo, and it was about 35% was the clinical pregnancy rate for that. And when we transfer two embryos, now this could be a little bit biased because frozen embryos, some of these could actually be five years old, because when somebody comes back for a thaw, it may be for their third child sometimes. And some of those could actually be um, frozen under the old slow freeze technology. But, but the message is showing you that there's very little difference whether you transfer one or two. The difference comes in the incidence of multiple things. I think that might be. 
the slides that I had. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry if it was a bit long-winded. Oh, that was terrific. That was wonderful. You're very the smartest good. guy we've ever had on this show. <laughs> well, I don't want to take the test. <laughs> and we, we have a number of questions. So here's a question. Um, what are the advantages of all of the antibodies are not transferred during a fresh cycle? But at a later date. Uh, do you want to take that one, John, or do you want me to take it? Well, I'll give you my interpretation. Um, this year, I have done that in more cycles than I have done in all of my previous years in practice combined. And you know, the theory behind it is that if the stimulation is very intense, it's hard to control the hormonal change that occurs at the level of the uterus. So you, one, your risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome becomes quite a bit higher. And you can control that through freezing everything. And two, the lining of the uterus may actually become quite a bit less favorable. There's a process that happens called premature luteinization that actually limits the ability of the lining of the uterus to accept the embryo. And, and that is, is linked to excess stimulation. So although you might get a lot of embryos and get you know um, a good numbers outcome, you may have a greater opportunity for clinical pregnancy by letting the uterus quiet down and transferring the good embryos that you've created in a more natural state. My belief is that this is the future of IVF. Um, it may portend to a better obstetrical outcome as well, because the, you know, the stimulation has also been linked to the production of the hormone relaxin, which, which may alter obstetrical outcomes down the line. So I, I feel this is going to be an area of an intense research over the next 10 years. Certainly don't have all the answers, but it's incredibly intriguing. If they do that as well, there's also a level of stress. Um, an IVF cycle is a very intense cycle, and you're you're stuck on the schedule that you're given, based on how you respond to the medication. People worry about the retrieval. They worry they worry about an awful lot of things. Probably wouldn't have to in a thought type of cycle. Uh, once that embryo is frozen, you're only bound to use it the day that you thought out. So if somebody even if they have a bad day at work or they catch a little bit of the flu, they don't feel good about having their transfer. You're not out that much to say, I'd rather do it next month. So it's, uh, it may not be hugely scientific, but there's there's certainly, thought cycles are a lot less stressful. Awesome. Um, what would be the most Okay, so that's a. I'll take that one. Thanks. Something else that's it's fairly new is um, there's becoming a lot more genetic screening that they're doing of embryos before they transfer them. And um, so, I mean, people are aware of Down syndrome as an aneuploid system of 21. There's a, there's a couple of others aneuploidies that are compatible with unhealthy. Babies. But there's a pile of other chromosomal abnormalities that are that are not compatible with even pregnancy, and yet they're compatible with forming a beautiful blastocyst. And so I think probably the biggest impact on why a blastocyst doesn't impact is there's it's genetically abnormal, and it, at a couple of days after you transfer it, and a required gene kicks in or a balance of genes kicks in, and it doesn't exist because of the genetic makeup of that particular embryo. So there's two components to having a good embryo. One is the machinery, and that's um, that's its ability to divide and get to that state from losses. And the other one is genetics, and that's the ability to keep going and differentiate into the person. So I, I'm sure there's uterine components as well. Probably every woman out of her 12 monthly cycles 
there's probably one or two dud cycles where it doesn't matter how good the embryo is, it doesn't matter how many you put back, none of them would implant. But I think that's probably a lower contributing factor to why people don't get pregnant. I think probably the biggest one, and there's there's certainly a lot of literature out there that's showing it, is that all blastocysts aren't genetically modified. Yeah, we have the ability now to actually do a, a complete chromosomal survey on blastocysts. And when I saw the data on the proportion of blastocysts that have an abnormal number of chromosomes, I was astounded. Yeah. Um, they, they look fantastic under the microscope, but at a genetic level, they just don't have it sometimes. And it's supposed to be more than half, even in young people. Absolutely. Okay, well, we just have an age question. Would five have an opportunity to do IVF with their own eggs? Unlikely. Yeah, I don't. Um, go, go ahead. I, well, I'll, I'll, what I was going to say is I'll, I'll give the stats. I know I, I shouldn't be speaking from the lab. I, I can tell you that I, I'm aware that in our program we have a, a, a woman that had a baby and she was pregnant from an IVF cycle at uh, 44.2. But the world literature, I think, at, at over age 43 is kind of like 1% or 2% by birth rate. And that's, it's a huge drop from 41 to 44. Am I right? Do you agree oh, with me, Dr. Absolutely. McDonald? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, I, I don't offer um, IVF to patients in that age range. And I know some people do. I, I simply, in my case, I cannot point to any track record that involves success at all. So because I have never had a live birth in a 44-year-old IVF patient, I can't claim any success in the matter at all. Um, I do have a patient in that age range who's going through IVF, but I sent her to one of my colleagues in the States, and he went through a cycle and had um, complete chromosomal survey done on the blastocyst to identify which of them were genetically normal. And those are going to be transferred in a couple of weeks from a thawed state. So there are exceptional circumstances that you can do, but I, I certainly don't um, offer it to the average patient. And something that's available that really wasn't available even three years ago is there are American egg banks that are just like sperm banks. And these offer a uh, very good opportunity for people that um, that want to get pregnant and now can have access to, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of different characteristics that are available. It's like a sperm bank. So it's, it's not like there's, there's people that have donated eggs and take it or leave it. It's become, a, the technology has made it possible to have Lots of options, and the success rate is nearly the same as a any thirty-year-old. Higher, isn't it? Well, we well, we don't get a lot of thirty-year-olds, right? <laughs> Everybody, questions are fantastic. I don't want to get into all of them, but there is one question that I know Dr. Mark is going to ask. Um. What's your opinion about single embryos? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think my take on that is, is I think you, from a practitioner standpoint, you need to trust your lab. Um, if you believe in the culture system in the lab, and if you are going to be brutally pragmatic about it, you'll often make the, the judgment call that if they can't make it to day five in the lab, that they're unlikely to make it to day five in the uterus. And, and that has been my experience that, you know, you will, I, I don't usually do an elective single embryo transfer on day three. I will do an only embryo transfer if that's the only viable embryo that we have available. But if we have, you know, three or, or more that look viable on day three, stratifying them through blastocyst culture is 
religion and and philosophically that's that's where I stand. And, and I'm going to go along with that as well. The only I'll, I'll be a little bit more controversial. If if somebody were to have only two embryos and they're worried about the quality of them on day three, I wouldn't be opposed to transferring both of those embryos um, uh, because that that way you do get something. Now I may I may adjust my view in the future, but that that's a big step for us to go to go to to, two, to go from two embryos to one embryo. Uh, like Dr. McNaught said, if if you go 0 for three or even 0 for five, then I think our incubator is darn near as good, if not um, as good as the uterus. So I, I think if you've got several and none of them make it, then you, it wasn't going to happen anyway. And the other thing is that beauty's in the eye of the beholder, and there's a lot of in vitro um, artifacts. And so there are embryos that really don't look very good in culture, but they have very good potential, and they just don't look like it. And a very good example of that is young women that over-respond to medication and they hyperstimulate. Their embryos tend to um, fragment lots of little pieces. Um, they really don't look like anything you'd see in the textbook, and yet they become blastocysts very often, and there's a very high pregnancy rate. But if you're looking at them strictly as a grading system, you would say these don't look very good. Maybe transfer two. That's what some people say. Regarding um, would you recommend all day five embryos? I don't. Um, it's so the, by far the majority of embryos that are genetically abnormal are just not going to result in a pregnancy or implantation. And so the the trauma that you do to all the embryos, biopsy the cells, and then you have to freeze them and do a transfer back after you get the results. Um, for people that have a risk, like a significant risk of having lots of abnormal embryos worth that risk because you're saving somebody having six embryo transfers to get the one that has the genetically normal one. Um, now, now, having said that, I think there's a big trend toward lots of people doing that genetic test, but it's a lot more involved and, and to be like a little bit objective about it, it, I think it's probably better and easier to have a fresh cycle of one embryo and then a thaw cycle of one embryo, then to go through the, the trouble and the expense, because it's quite expensive, of doing the genetic screening to end up with the same thing, transferring one embryo but, but only one transfer. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think when people find out the price tag on, on chromosomal analysis, it would they'd be less enthusiastic about it because of course, we can't change which of the embryos are chromosomally normal. It really just allows you to pick the embryo which is the, has the highest chance of implantation. But if you're ultimately going to transfer them all, that you know, really just decreases the time that it would take you to become pregnant. And of course, it involves removing cells from the developing blastocyst. So it's not atraumatic. Um, it's in Exceptional circumstances, like the, you know, the the patient who is in, in her mid 40s, I think it holds occasional promise. But for the average patient, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, I think people are I just. I don't want people to be picturing these um, embryos that are genetically ab abnormal giving rise to horribly abnormal kids. These embryos that are genetically abnormal, they basically don't they don't implant. They go as far as the blastocyst. And then they then they degenerate after you think more than more than likely, or they'll go to a very early implantation. All right. The high risk of pregnancy with the 
five days after IBM. It's not a high risk, but it's um, it's it's probably several times higher than the general population. So even in our clinic, we probably I, I think we've had three cases of of you transfer one, and it splits into two. So it's I don't I don't know Dr. McNaught what the what do you quote for the for the twinning rate in the general population, but it, but I would say it's probably eight times or ten times more, but it's not that still isn't much. Yeah, like what we're talking about is a monozygotic twin where where one embryo has split into two, and that's a very that you know is a, a lot riskier a twin pregnancy than. Um, a dichorionic twin pregnancy where, where two embryos each have implanted on their own. Um, obviously, if you put back one blast, it's going to be about, I think, one and a half percent of the time it'll split into a monozygotic pregnancy, um, which is a lot less than had previously been reported in the literature. So monozygosity is not really the risk that um, we once thought it was. But when they do happen, they are much riskier twin pregnancies than what you get from two embryos at a time. So, you know, it is a risk involved with single embryo transfer, but it's the practice of ESET itself doesn't, doesn't confer the risk of monozygotic twinning. Um, two can just as easily become three through that process, and then you're in really hot water. A good practice still involves transferring really is, is two embryos as are reasonable. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I know that there are many on a Wednesday. I know there's a lot of great So I want to thank everybody who I want to um, thank Dr. You guys are fantastic. And and I apologize we couldn't get to all of the questions. Um, but what we're, what I'm going to be doing is highlight your questions. And if there's an for Dr. Okay, well thanks so much. Thank, Thank you very you. much everybody and have a Appreciate great it. night.